On November 7, 2007, a Shell oil company team worked to recover drilling equipment located on the seabed close to the Gulf of Mexico. They were working near a well around 7,800 feet below the ocean's surface, when their camera zoomed in on the creature you see in the video. Hovering near the oil well perpendicular to the ground was a massive squid with 10 flexible arms ending in dangling tentacles. It looked like one of the aliens from the movie Independence Day, said Patrick Desrulo, Shell's senior operations coordinator when he first saw the records. The video circulated among email inboxes within the oil industry before reaching Michael Vecchione, an expert in deep-sea cephalopods from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. With his extensive knowledge, Vecchione successfully identified the squid in the video as a big fin squid belonging to the Magnapina genus. Since its discovery 115 years ago, the big fin squid has been observed in the wild only 12 times around the world. The first specimen was caught by fishers in Portugal in 1907. However, it would take over 80 years before another sighting was reported when this giant squid was spotted swimming three miles beneath the ocean's surface near the coast of Brazil in 1988. Because of the vast distance between sightings, scientists believe that the squid could live all over the world and could actually be very common in the ocean ecosystem, as they have been spotted in the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans, as well as the Gulf of Mexico. While the squid seen at the beginning of the video was 7,900 feet underwater, the current depth record for a big fin squid is 20,400 feet, making it the first and only squid known to inhabit the Hadal Zone. Just to emphasize how insane it is, the pressure at this depth is approximately 60 megapascals, which is equivalent to around 600 times atmospheric pressure at sea level. For decades, trawling the seafloor with nets was one of the only ways to explore the depths of the ocean. This approach often damages the soft bodies of deep sea organisms beyond recognition, and the mangled specimens are then difficult to identify. Fortunately, new technologies such as ROVs, equipped with high-definition cameras, let scientists see species as they've never seen before. In 1998, the University of Hawaii biologists Richard Young and Michael Vecchione became the first to formally document big fin squid, and this document that I will be referring to further in the video is the only known description of the anatomy and biology of the big fin squid since these squids live very deep, and this was the only time scientists were able to obtain a specimen for study. There are no other similar studies that I was able to find, so I will leave the link to their research paper in the description, and I strongly suggest you check it out. Two larger specimens were collected near the surface of the eastern Pacific Ocean, and the other rehydrated from a dried specimen originally recovered from the stomach of an Aleposaurus, which is also a huge fish. It grows up to 7 feet in length and weighs 9 kilograms, but Anyway, what they discovered completely changed our understanding of big fin squid's biology and anatomy. DNA analysis on tissue samples has shed some light on their evolutionary history. That's how we know they are related to another group of deep sea cephalopods called Mastigotethus, which have two long sticky tentacles. Big fin squid have eight arms and two tentacles with elbow-like bends that give the squid its unique look. Tentacles are thick and robust with fleshy membranes. How exactly they use them is unknown, but each of these appendages has microscopic, sticky suckers on them which are placed in approximately eight series except near tentacle bases. Scientists think it's likely that squids use them like a long net to trap prey that bump into them as they hang down in the water below their body or drag along the sea floor. Basically, they're a living spiderweb. The part of the body called the mantle is thin and not connected to the head in the back of the neck. There is also a large piece of cartilage in that area. The muscles of the mantle and just a little bit behind, about 6 millimeters in front of the back fin, and the length of the mantle is smaller than what is typically seen. The head is wider than long, and there is a jelly-like ridge on the back bottom side of the head that shows the presence of a bony crest and folds. Next to it, there is a noticeable white structure called the olfactory bulb. 
The eyes are large and take up the entire side of the head. The eyelids have a clear space where the optic nerve enters and the iris of each eye has reflective tissue as well as the eyeball. Although no longer hard, the rehydrated specimen was still stiff and very fragile. The arm filaments broke when they were manipulated for measurement. So, the main source of information about the third specimen is the photograph taken before it was dried out. After comparing the rehydrated specimen to the photo, scientists found that they have similar characteristics in the following. The tail is bent to the side, the fins have holes, the arm tips look like worms, and the overall size is the same. Although the general proportions of the fins and mantle are similar to those of the Magna Pinna, the brachial crown differs substantially. The tentacle diameter is much less than that of the arms, and the tips of all arms and tentacles are missing. So it is impossible to determine whether the vermiform filaments were present. Considering the size of the squid and that all the specimens were damaged, this is the only known information about their anatomy and biology. And aside from these observations, not much more is known about the big fin squid. However, there were other expeditions, but they mostly tried to capture them on video with the help of ROVs. The first visual record of the long-armed squid was in September 1988. The crew of the submersible Nautile encountered the big fin squid off the coast of northern Brazil at a depth of 15,560 feet. But these videos did not receive any media attention. Most were brief and fairly blurry. But among the recent studies, the most interesting so far was the large-scale research program in the Great Australian Bight. Remotely operated vehicles and a towed camera system were deployed in depths of 3,200 and 10,000 feet, resulting in five big fin squid sightings. These sightings not only represent the first time that big fin squid has been seen in Australian waters, but also the first time that five of them have been caught swimming together in one place. The remarkable footage captured by underwater cameras trailing behind a large research vessel provides an unprecedented look at the bizarre biology and behavior of this cephalopod species. They were able to measure one specimen with lasers, but as in all previous measurements, the estimates were based on nearby objects. It measured 5.9 feet in length. The specimen's mantle was around 6 inches, with the remaining 5.9 feet made of long arms and tentacles. There is much to learn about the big fin squid. Basic questions such as what it feeds upon, how it reproduces, etc. But one exciting thing about the research is that all five specimens were found clustered in one place, which has never been seen before. Why they were grouped together is one more question without an answer, but this behavior is often associated with survival or mating opportunities. Deep sea gigantism is yet another interesting thing to study. In the coldest and deepest parts of the ocean, sea creatures, mainly invertebrates or animals without backbones, can reach truly giant sizes. Squids, sea spiders, giant tube worms, isopods, and a variety of other types of animals grow to sizes that dwarf related species around the world. But why do these deep sea animals grow so big? Let me explain. In 1960, Jacques Picard and Don Walsh embarked on a dive in the Trieste Bathyscaphe to an astonishing depth of 35,800 feet. The descent to the ocean surface took 4 hours and 47 minutes, and when they finally reached the Earth's deepest point, they were shocked to see some species of fish casually swimming around. Despite extensive research, biologists still don't fully understand the reasons behind giant proportions observed in certain deep sea creatures, but they have some good theories. You'd think that deep sea pressure would cause animals to be smaller rather than larger, but water pressure doesn't pose much of a problem because the creatures are mostly water themselves, and water is not easy to compress. In fact, it is actually the buoyancy of these organisms that allows them to grow so large. They simply don't need to fight gravity. Here are the two general rules that seem to dictate this growth, Kleiber's rule and Bergman's rule. According to Kleiber's rule, larger animals are generally more efficient than smaller ones. For example, if we take a cat, which is approximately 100 times heavier than a mouse, the cat's metabolism will be roughly 32 times higher than that of the mouse. Kleiber's law, like many other biological laws, is a consequence of the physics and geometry of animal circulatory systems. 
it is also closely tied with the surface area to volume and the fractal nature of blood vessels. In the vast depths of the oceans, these giant animals depend on food to drop from above, and since food resources are often limited, that's why they have every incentive to become more efficient, and therefore larger. Bergman's rule is a general correlation between increasing body size with decreasing temperature. Populations and species of larger size tend to live in colder environments, while smaller organisms are more commonly found in warmer regions. This happens because cold temperatures significantly slows down animals' metabolisms, and creatures in this ecosystem often grow and mature significantly slower. A good example is the Greenland shark. This slow-moving shark can grow to be 24 feet long and can weigh up to 1.5 tons, but that growth is spread out over a lifespan that extends for centuries. Greenland sharks grow approximately 0.4 inches per year and don't reach maturity until they're around 150 years old. A lack of predators in the deep sea also contributes to the fact that these sharks can live so long and grow so large. So there you have it, a part of it is an adaptation to the pressure and cold environment of the deep sea, while the other aspect is the slow metabolism. But it doesn't mean that the entire deep sea ecosystem is the same. We still know little about its diverse environments or the various lifestyles of animals that live there, but the big fin squid will always be symbolic of many of the ocean's extremes and mysteries that still remain to be solved. Thank you very much for watching the video until the end. Hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and share your thoughts in the comment section below. See you tomorrow.